we wanted to do the comedy thing early, because last time we saved the comedy stuff until way late, and you didn't realize that you guys were meant to have a good time. Another thing that Gabe hasn't said is we're trying to make it interesting and fun. I've been to so many medical conferences, and you guys have been to medical conferences, and it's the same format all the time. It's someone upstairs at the front giving their lecture, and everyone's listening. And you know, it's OK, but I think we can do better. And I think we can create something that's actually genuinely interesting and fun. And that's what we want to do. So again, I just want to say thank you to Gabe for the great introduction. Thank you all for being here. Our numbers are swelling. And so that means that people obviously enjoyed it last time. And um, we've got some really exciting stuff that we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to go beyond the germ theory. And so I wanted to start just by talking about where did this all, where did this all start and, the, and to start with the germ theory. So who was the first person to come up with actually understanding that there were germs at all? It's this guy called um, Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis. And uh, he was a, a, an Austrian physician in about the 1860s. He worked this out. And uh, obviously, he won a Nobel Prize. No, sorry, I'm actually hearing. He was put in a mental hospital and died there. <laughs> because basically, the physicians didn't really like the fact that he was telling them that going straight from the morgue to delivering babies was a bad idea and was probably killing babies. So obviously, he sent them into the mental, uh, mental hospital. And you know, I think we're going to see today that maybe some people who are challenging the existing paradigms of what's happening today are getting a similar kind of reception. Maybe not exactly the same way, but certainly not winning uh, Nobel Prizes yet. Then Louis Pasteur uh, comes along. And Louis, Louis Pasteur is the, the father of the germ theory. He, um, his name is on everything. You get pasteurized milk and so forth. And uh, he sort of he, he, he came up with it. He was in a bit of a tussle in the 1890s in France. The 1890s in France must have been an unbelievably interesting and fun time to be because the art renaissance and you know, there was so much happening around there. Innovation, um, Art Deco was starting there 30 years before it ever came here. And you know, Béchamp and Pasteur were in a little bit of a battle to see who was going to win out because Pasteur said it was all about the germ. And Béchamp said, le terrain est tout, le microbe n'est rien, which basically means that, the, um, that it's the terrain. And the terrain is a word that comes up a lot in holistic medicine. People know about the terrain. And so we're all sort of Béchampian in a certain way. But what I want to say is like we've, we've understood the germ theory for a while. I think it's actually been potentially a net positive to society. But what we really need to do now is take a fundamental step back and look where we actually are and see whether this model is serving us moving forward. Because just recently, the deputy director of the CDC says, we have reached the end of the antibiotic era period, right? There is an unbelievably short window of society from like the, eight, the 1920s until about now where antibiotics have been affected. Neither my great grandparents or my great granddaughter will get the benefit of antibiotics because of the overuse of what we're using now. So we need a new plan. And that, what we hope tonight, is just sharing out some of the, some of the details of what a, a plan might be given the fact that we don't have these tools available to ourselves. And then the next big step was the Human Microbiome Project. And the Human Microbiome Project finished in 2011 and essentially was looking to essentially catalog all of the germs, what they are, what they did, how they work. And we're just at the beginning to understand it. So if anyone tells you that we understand it and it's difficult and it's, you know, that we know everything, we know nothing. A bit of humility, a massive dose of humility would go a long way if we're actually going to get a sustainable situation to, to where we're moving. So... Um, the next thing that we have to look at is, so I, I, had the, I had the pleasure of learning about this. So that my, my journey with this, um, back in 2011, I had Larry Pilevsky come and speak to a group of practitioners at the uh, Energetics College. And he was the first person to really put into my mind that, you know, there's no more or less germs around at a different time. Like, you know... Let me lay out two scenarios that he likes to lay out, but I'm not going to steal his whole thunder because he's got so, he's got so much genius information to, to produce later. But let's just put two different, different uh, ideas here. Either at the end of October, all of the germs that have been hiding in the sea right, come out and attack and cause flu season. That's one alternative, and that's what we've all believed. There's more germs, you're sneezing on me, I'm sneezing on you, we're all getting sick. Or, the average American eats six pounds of sugar on October 31st. And then again at the end of November, and then again at Christmas. Which one is it? Or maybe it's a combination of the two. So anyway, Larry introduced me to the fact that there was, no, there was a lot of germs around, and there was no more germs at one time than other. 
And then I was walking, this is June 2012, I saw this uh, on the front cover of Scientific American. It was the first of the reporting on the Human Microbiome Project, and I was like, finally, this is Scientific American, it's getting out, it was really exciting. Then I went to ACAM, and if you don't know who this guy is, his name is Bob Browntree. And one of the things that we talked about last week, uh, last month in the Functional Forum is, as an educator, which all of you are, doctor as teacher, what's more important is getting people to want to learn. Telling them stuff is less important. Getting them to want to learn is really important. And I can credit Bob Roundtree by, I went to a two hour lecture on the Human Microbiome Project in, uh, in November 2012, and I was hooked. I had to know everything about it. And luckily, there was stuff coming out every day on the internet. I was in South Africa for six weeks with my wife, and I was reading books, reading articles, reading magazines, because I realized this is the next era of medicine, and we're just starting to understand it. So Bob, I can, I can really um, credit him for that. But who else is spreading the word? So uh, we created this at Energetics, and you can get one of yours outside at the Energetics booth. Um, an infographic, we put it on Mind Body Green. Um, we got Jason and, and Colleen from Mind Body Green in the house, and a lot of other really interesting people here. Um, but it got a lot of traffic, and people were sort of into it. I wrote a number of articles about it. But what we really needed was someone else. We needed someone out on TV, someone who had a, a, a platform to talk about this different, to talk about the, this other hypothesis. And there was only one single voice on TV talking about it, and his show got yanked before he was able to really make a difference. And so I just want to show you who this guy was, because I think he's a bit of a legend. Can we run the video? Get a mirror so we can see this. <laughs> we might have to go into stealth mode like before. <laughs> there we go. Also, I'm Office. No, no, no. They will cost you your life. <laughs> the worst thing you can do for your immune system is to coddle it. They need to fight their own battles. If Saber really cared about our well-being, they would set up hand desanitizing stations. <laughs> A single wall at every juncture filled with dirt, vomit, fecal matter. <laughs> Exposing yourself to germs is the best way to make yourself stronger. So by that rationale, if I had a sneeze, I should just sneeze on you. <laughs> yes. I would welcome it. <laughs> You're welcome. The principle is sound. To avoid illness, expose yourself to germs, enabling your immune system to develop antibodies. <laughs> I don't know why everyone doesn't do this. <laughs> so his wife was a bit of a hero. It was a bit of a random part in a random office episode, but. I just thought um, it was absolutely genius, and, and it's unfortunate that this guy was sort of like, in some ways, a village idiot, but maybe uh, in, in, in time it'll be seen. So let's take a look at, at the different parts of the biome. So there, there's five major areas where we have a, a large interaction with microbes, although it's really er everywhere. Um, the biggest is the stomach and the intestines. That's responsible for the vast majority. And we're going to go through some of the details of the microbiome, but very, very high level overview. More than 99% of germs are mutually beneficial. We need them for uh, digestion and met metabolism and immunity, among a thousand things that we don't yet understand that they do. There's an unbelievably synergistic relationship going on with them. And so we're just starting to understand a little bit more about them. So the stomach and the intestines is one major part. The mouth, larynx, and respiratory system is another one. Skin is another one. And the um, neurogenital tract is, 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 is all areas. And just to give one example of how we have co-evolved with these, uh, with these, so around the same time that I was in South Africa and I was learning about the microbiome, my wife is also four to six months pregnant. So I was really interested in that process. So if there are a lot of microbes in the genital tract, right, and the web, the main way that the baby gets those gets the uh, microbes is going through that through a regular birth. Guess what those microbes do? Guess what they break down? Guess what they help? They help in the digestion of milk, right? So right from the beginning, you're getting exactly the right microbes at exactly the right time to digest mother's milk, which is going to be the first food that's coming along. So when I said humility earlier, surely this is a great example of just a little bit of humility. Say, look, let's stop messing with it. You know, the, the tools that we've created had value at one time and continue to have value, but maybe aren't going to have value in the long term. So I said at the beginning, if you guys saw the flight here, 
We've got you Biome sponsoring this event. And the, one of the things that you can do tonight is you can get a kit from us at the end where you can actually sequence all of these for yourself. You can see what microbes are living inside of you. And I use the phrase at the beginning, secure your own oxygen mask before helping others. Because like, you guys are going to go out and deliver medicine tomorrow. Some of you are probably going to go and deliver antibiotics to your patients. Secure your own mask before you help others, because you might be doing some people a disservice. And I think that Ubiome is uh, not a per it's the beginning of a very exciting trend, which is called citizen science where we're taking the science away from people that have done science for a long time that may or may not have ended us in a good situation into a place where everyone can participate through the internet and so forth. And when you get your Ubiome kit, you send it off, and then you can compare your results with a lot of other people, and you can see changes over time. It's really exciting. We're really excited to have them on board for this event. So I want to just end this section and uh, bring on our first guest, Dr. Larry Pilevsky, but most of you came in here, or some of you came in here, completely believing in the germ theory. And by the end of Larry's talk, you may think that something else is completely different is going on. I hope that's the case. But this is one of my favorite quotes from F. Scott Fitzgerald. He says, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function, right? These are going to be opposed ideas, but we all have to go to work and do our jobs tomorrow. So. I hope that there's a lot of physicians out there in New York with first-rate intelligence. I trust that there is. And um, this is just the beginning of the, the welcoming to it. So what we're going to show right now, Mark, is the uh, video from NPR. Last week, the, the subject of my main talk was about curating resources for your patients rather than telling them stuff. You tell them all the stuff about the microbiome. Next door, we've got the microbiome poster that you can have in your patient waiting room. But what we're going to show today is basically the best video that I think that you could curate to every single one of your patients so that they could get a baseline understanding of this new science. It was put together by NPR, um, and uh, we'll have uh, that five-minute video that just gives you a good idea of where this is going, a starting point, and then we'll have um, Dr. Larry Pilevsky. So thanks very much for being here, and uh, enjoy. Enjoy.